If you've ever stood in line at a supermarket or been on Facebook or opened a popular magazine or watched local TV or national TV, someone's told you what to eat for your brain, right? And all these headlines are real and have generated, each one's generated questions to my website, uh, you know, or to me in my practice, like, is it really true canola oil is bad for your brain? And is, does, is, it, is sugar bad for your brain? And, and can I still really drink coffee? And those three questions we will answer tonight. Um, and hopefully any other questions that you have, we'll have time for all of that. Because we're talking in a really general way about how and what you feed your brain. And if you happen to read the article, the wonderful article by Ellen Waldman, um, very kind about our endeavor in the Ashland Daily Tidings, she said that tonight's um, topic was sleep for your brain, which was my mistake, not hers, and they're related. So really the topic for tonight is you feed your brain by properly figuring out how you sleep and how you eat for your brain. We're going to go over some background about the recommendations that I'm going to share with you. And then we'll go over many details, but bring it down to three really important steps to remember that you can walk away with, that can make a difference in your health and your brain's health without having to remember every detail on every slide. And we'll always have time for questions. So if you've come to any one of my talks, you've seen the next three slides, my favorite. So in case you haven't been here, I'll just run through my little spiel. So whether you've got a high IQ or a low IQ, your brain is brilliant. It's just done a myriad of things in the last half hour. It's figured out how to get here, how to open the door, how to respond to the heat or the cold, how to, do I know that person or not? How to make a social distinction about whether you're going to recognize whether or not you know them. I was pulling up in the parking lot and I saw somebody and I thought, I think I'll have time to get to the parking space before she walks by my car. Time for me to remember her name. Um, and she went by before I got out of my car, but I did remember her name. So, you know, your brain's done all sorts of things and that's not even giving it credit for breathing, regulating your temperature, beating your heart digesting whatever last meal you've eaten or giving you messages that you have to eat again. So your brain is amazing. And that's before it even starts thinking. So to do all these things, your brain is also incredibly hungry. It needs lots and lots of nutrients of all different sorts. And we'll talk specifically about those tonight. And um, colors are really important. And each one of the Yes, I'd say each one of those elements in the picture is necessary, those nutrients, but not enough. There's even more your brain wants. In addition to being hungry, your brain is incredibly sensitive, okay? It's constantly reading whether it's got enough, what the environment is like, how you're feeling, whether it can work for you today or not. Let's talk a little bit about how it does that. So I said your brain's really hungry. And if you could ask your brain, it would ask you, please pass me fuel, just some plain calories. I need calories. I need all these vitamins to work. And these other vitamins, C, D, and E, while you're at it, I'd like those too. I'd really sub love some, mag some minerals. Magnesium's the one I crave the most. But you know, I've heard it's hard to get it to me. Just the right amounts of zinc and copper, and I want iron, and your brain wants a lot more. Luckily, we're not going to piece all those things out. I mean, if you come to see me, you know I am going to give you a lot of little supplement bottles of things, but hopefully a lot of it actually comes in the food. Uh, this is the sciencey part of the talk. I love this slide. This is from Dr. Bredesen's first paper that he published in October of 2014 in which he described reversing Alzheimer's in nine out of 10 patients and taught me something I'd never heard about in medical school, which is we have this protein, which is in the middle here, the middle fiber, um, called an amyloid precursor protein. And it spans the distance from the inside of the cell to the extracellular space 
of all the cells throughout our body. I like to think of it like a muscle and a bone cell in my leg have amyloid precursor proteins. Not very many of them, but has some. And my brain has tons of them. Every cell in my brain has these proteins spanning from the inside to the outside. And they're constantly on the outside detecting what's going on in the world around the cell. Am I getting enough? Is it safe out here? Oh my God, she just walked by a dryer sheet. That's in my mind one of the most toxic thing that people underappreciate how toxic they are. And it says, you know, this is not a safe place for me to be. I'm going to shut down temporarily. And if you don't have the gene for Alzheimer's, you don't have Alzheimer's, you're more likely to break your little amyloid precursor protein into two sections. And um, that's a more recoverable breakage. If you have the APOE4 gene, or you're actually moving on to Alzheimer's, you're more likely to break it all asunder into a bunch of different parts of the original molecule, the protein. And this is most more likely to not be able to respond to tomorrow. When you do feed your brain well enough, or you do have a good environment for your brain, that little breakage on the right may just scar down and become amyloid plaque, whereas this one on the left may sort of like wake up again tomorrow and say, oh, the vitamins are back and the dryer sheet is gone. It kind of reassembles itself and it goes on and it tells the cell, you know, I was telling you, you were gonna have to downsize and become a smaller cell and make fewer connections with the rest of the brain, but I was wrong. You can go on talking to the rest of the brain. And so working a life program around those sensor proteins involves a brain, whole brain healthy protocol that involves lifestyle, diet, supplements, particularly to feed your brain, the replacement of lost hormones, the identification of anything injurious to your brain. We eliminate it and we help you recover from it. But before we can eat, before we can talk about how we're gonna feed that hungry brain cell, imagine if this is the kitchen that you walk into before you're gonna make dinner. Like, would you cook yourself a nice dinner or would you go out for takeout? I would go out. You know, that is just too much of a mess. Um, and frankly, your brain um, is a little bit the same way. And so that it becomes really important before we eat that things are kind of cleaned out and that we eat in a programmed and kind of orderly way throughout the day. One of the worst contributions to American health in general was whoever came with the, up with the idea that we're cows and that we should graze all day. I am not a cow, are you a cow? No, six, three meals and three snacks over the day. That's the wrong way to eat. We really need time and space between our meals. We need to think about when we eat. And the first thing that's really important in our brain is that part of the time we don't eat. And the most important time to not eat is? Overnight, overnight right. So for all of us, if you're worried about your brain health, if you're worried about getting a cancer, I mean, we've heard there's a pretty toxic environment, it's really good to go 12 or 13 hours overnight without eating. Ideally, three of those hours are before bedtime, and you'll actually sleep better. If you have the APOE4 gene for Alzheimer's, Dr. Bredesen likes to see you push it up to 14 hours overnight without eating, maybe even more, depending on your particular blood sugar. So the first thing about eating is that you don't eat after dinner, and you don't eat before breakfast. You make that a nice long space. And while you're fasting overnight, it's really important for your brain <clears throat> for it to receive fuel the next day that you sleep well. Well, of course, it's nice to ever to sleep. Everybody should sleep well. You know, what's the big deal? And I, I was trying to 
I've looked for this picture and I finally found it. So you can imagine this, this is a restaurant somewhere and at night they put the chairs up on the tables and they move the tables out of the way so this lovely helpful woman can hose down the space where the tables used to be and make it really clean. There's no clutter there. So the next day can start fresh. And your brain does that every night. Your brain cells shrink. You put your chairs on top of your tables. And you open up the pathways in between your brain cells. And you literally hose it down with something called glymph. So, you know, we have lymph nodes here because we have lymph circulating throughout our bodies. But we have glymph in our brains. And that's what's happening in your brain when you go overnight without eating and you're ready the next day if you've had a good night's sleep. So doesn't it happen if I just don't eat overnight? No, gl this glymphatic rinsing happens between four and eight hours of sleep. So to sleep really well and have that glymphatic drainage, I suggest you sleep. I I'm like always idealizing farmers' lives. But I have to say, has anyone read the book Sapiens? Isn't it an interesting book? It's an interesting book. Bill Gates recommended it, but I found it at Costco. And it's about really the appearance of humankind on the planet. And one of the worst things we ever did was invent agriculture. Uh, you know, we were actually all really healthier before that. But you can't go back. And now we're leaving agriculture behind. And compared to our modern life, there's a lot of things about the kind of archetypal farmer's life that I imagine could confer a good night of sleep. So if you sleep like an organic farmer, you know, organic farmers care a lot about quality. So I care about the quality of your sleep. I care that you fall asleep pretty easily, that you go deeply asleep for the whole first half of the night. And then for the second half, you kind of come to almost a consciousness and you go back down again and almost a consciousness, and you come back down again, and you have a perfect brainwave pattern of sleep that anybody could detect, that it happens from dark to dawn, more or less. If, you have, if you're working the night shift at the hospital, you can still get eight good hours of sleep from the bar closing to you know mid-morning, but it's better to get it dark to dawn, we think, because your brain knows when it's dawn. And before it's dawn, your brain makes, your body makes a hormone called cortisol, and cortisol tends to wake people up. So it's better if that happens when you're actually ready to wake up instead of in the middle of the night. To make this happen, it's really great to get your exercise early in the day, to get some outside time, and ideally that's early in the day, and to always go to bed with the attitude that tomorrow's just another work day. It's just another day. I don't have to be all excited about tomorrow or be anxious about it because of what I'm doing. But it's a work day, so I'm not going to go out drinking and partying. I'm going to get to bed early in preparation for another nice day tomorrow. And sleeping well also means avoiding these pitfalls. If you have short or excessively broken sleep, that's hard on your brain. I list these not because, uh oh, you're, it's, a, it's bad if you had them, but it's a problem that can be solved. There's solutions for all these pitfalls. So short or broken sleep is not a thing. I remember having a patient a long time ago who said, I sleep from 10 to 1. I wake up, I do my best work, and I go back to sleep, and I sleep from 3 to 8. And I said, I think you should get up and do something boring at night. Like you're rewarding yourself with your most creative work. So if you're doing something to encourage broken sleep, that's not a good idea. If it's just happening to you, it's something that can be fixed. And we know that blue light at night, and blue light, of course, comes from this little puppy and our smartphones. So people a lot of times are reading or watching movies on their smartphone or their iPad. No, I'm not on the computer. I just do it all on my iPad at night. But uh, any of these smart devices emit blue light, except for the older Kindles. The older Kindles are not blue lit. <coughs> Sitting is the new smoking. I'm sure you've heard that. Sitting all day is not good for your ability to sleep at night. It's better to exercise. 
inside light isn't real light, get some real light outside, and passing out is not sleeping. <laughs> You know, when, where do pe when do people pass out? People pass out, obviously, if they've had too much to drink. But people also pass out in front of the TV. And I, I highly recommend against that. You know, like you need to identify when you're getting sleepy. Go get ready and go to bed so you can have a real night of sleep. Anybody who's curious about anything particular I say and they want, like, how did you come up with that bizarre recommendation? Please ask me. There's an answer to almost every question along those lines. So when you don't eat is you don't eat overnight. You try to go at least four hours between meals without snacking. And if it's three hours and you're hungry, you snack. And tomorrow you eat a bigger lunch so that you make it to dinner without having to snack. So, because snacks are really not your brain's friend. And uh, something that Karen, Karen White, so two of my the beloved team members are here for Northwest Memory Center. Rachel, whom you've probably all met and talked to, who's the mastermind of organizing everything, and Karen, who's one of our health coaches. And she and I were just talking about fasting, and fasting is a little bit in the news. She said she's done a two-day fast, and there's really some questions of when and where a one-day, two-day three day or even seven to 10 day. We have a champion of fasting here. What's your longest? Yeah. 10 days. She had reason to do it. I'm not recommending it to everybody. I would never recommend it, but I did 29 days once. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you, you seem fine, but I too, I would not, I would not recommend it. Even 10 is a tough and uh, I, anyway. Okay, what to eat. So if you go onto an Alzheimer's website, they'll tell you, here's the foods you can eat, and if you eat these foods, you'll have a good brain for the rest of your life. And while I don't disagree with them, okay, that's half a day. What do I eat the other half of the day, and what do I eat the rest of the week? That's an incomplete answer as far as I'm concerned. So let's get a little bit more answer. It does start with leafy greens. The main part of what's on your plate, the real estate on your plate, figuratively or literally, should largely be taken up with colorful vegetables. And they provide, I, I got to do a talk, Ashland High School this week had a day of talks for teachers' health and invited people from the community to come and give talks about health. And I talked about feeding your brain. And the woman I shared the room with was a nutritionist at um, Dr. Stone's office. And she talked also, she talked about eating for longevity. And she gave us all the names, which are all the reasons why we're eating all these foods, the polyphenols and the antioxidants and the, no, the different kinds of both. The, the things these foods provide for us, these colorful foods that are mostly vegetables, a little bit fruit and a little bit starchy vegetables, but not a lot, um, they provide simple calories, but they provide antioxidants in all the color, different vitamins for all the color, and different kinds of fiber. So fiber is important for our gut to be healthy, and each person's fiber need is different. But I'd say overall, I'd 100 times value this fiber over psyllium seed or what do they call it, the, you know, the, and Miralax, which is not even really a fiber, but the kinds of fibers that doctors often recommend to help people um, move their bowels well. These are the fibers that will do that. Um, any foods up there, anybody particular? Can I ask a question, is that okay? Yeah. Um, are you against any of those things? You see little things here on the computer that says don't eat any lectin, Right, so lectins are, are specific. So lectins are a category of food that, you know, broadly speaking would include beans, and beans aren't up there. And they are a category of foods that for some people trigger inflammatory reactions. So we might, with someone who's really inflammatory, say they need to give up um, potatoes or they need to give up avocado for some. So individually, the only thing I would say is you shouldn't eat a lot of apples because these are 
modern creation that's mostly sugar. But other than that, I'm not generally opposed to any of these foods. Connie? What about squash? Yeah, aren't there any up there? Eggplant. I th oh, do you think that's squash way up there at the top? I think that's zucchini. Boy, we have a volunteer delicata squash this summer. It's this big. We had to ask at the farmer's market somebody to tell us if we should like pick it because it's going to like take over the world. And so cold water fish is one of the things that's on the, everybody's list for brain health, and it is important. But really, all these different kinds of protein are potentially valuable, except for grains, um, because they really provide more sugar than they do protein. So if you're going to get the protein part of your diet, these are the sources to look for. Um, eggs and dairy and beans for people who are vegetarian, and um, which only leaves the meat for the rest of us. Um, shellfish is great, and most shellfish is clean. Don't have to worry about its toxins or really what it's doing to the planet. Salmon is great to get wild salmon, and Costco has wild salmon, as do all the stores around here. We are also lucky around here, and I think even in the far reaches of other states, I hear they have grass-fed meat uh, and pasture-raised chicken. So having those, and of course, you know, I always plug these women. They're doing a great job at the farmer's markets. Uproot Ashland is selling the best chicken I've ever had and the best pork I've ever had. And it's all free range. It's great. OK, this is a quiz. What Can you tell what this is? is it or liver? liver and onions. So what nutrient can you only get from these foods? What nutrient can you only get from these foods? Choline, right. So choline is really important for two completely different processes in your body and more. Like, it helps you sleep, all sorts of things. But choline is really important for the brain because the main messenger in the brain is acetylcholine. You need choline for the brain. But it also, it really does help your liver to be healthy, to eat liver. So our livers in this modern world now are suffering because we've eaten too much sugar. And our livers are all getting a little bit fatty. And as you get older, you all, we all have that tendency a little bit. It's better than not getting older, but it is part of getting older. Um, and liver, choline in general is one of the things that really protects the health of your liver. So my recommendation is two or three egg yolks a day. You might as well eat the whites. You need some protein. Um, and liver. And if you don't like liver, what's a more a kinder way to eat liver? Pate, right. Great pate at the co-op. And great recipes on my Dr. Deborah website. So dark berries are the fruit that's really great, the fruit that everybody really likes the most for your brain. But is that the only fruit? There's got to be others. Oops, no, really, that's all. So in terms of for your brain health, I'm not saying you should never eat another berry, a different kind of berry, or a peach. It's summer, good heavens, eat a peach. But really, for your brain, the fruit that's best for your brain are berries that are dark and that are dark on the inside as well as the outside which kind of means wild berries around here, not those big, beautiful ones that Pennington Farms makes at the farmer's market. So what about grains? Our bread's the staff of life. Shouldn't we eat bread? And couldn't I, every once in a while, eat some sugar? I'd say ice cream would be my favorite weakness. And I, But now, you know, if you go without sugar, how many people are, make kind of an effort to keep sugar out of their lives? You know, and I, I think I, I'm down to ice cream once or twice a year. I used to have it in college every day. I lived across the street from an ice cream store in Berkeley. What could I do? Anyway, these sugars in particular, not the ones in the vegetables and not the ones in the berries, these sugars are really not great for your brain, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Fats from these foods are great, from eggs and avocados. Imagine there's a little dairy in the eggs and 
dairy is a little questionable, but in general, if you can handle dairy, it's good for your brain. And wild fish is the best. And then there's healthy oils from these two fruits. Hey, here's some more fruits we can eat. <laughs> right? They count as fruits, don't they? Olives and avocados? Did I hear a nay? I think they are. Um, they're great sources. And olive oil, I'd recommend you look for organic. It, even if it's not organic, you're more likely to get an unmixed olive oil if you buy an organic one. Avocado oil, you can buy any avocado oil you want. We have yet to find kind of a tainted avocado oil in the market. But the reason I put this most expensive olive oil up here is for the brand Primal Kitchen. Um, Primal Kitchen, so the place people would go, oh yeah, these are the oils I eat, these are the oils I eat, and then, you know, unless you make your own salad dressing, if you buy pre-made salad dressings, they have other oils in them, which I advise against, but Primal Kitchen makes them all with olive oil and avocado oil. Fish oil is another great fat for, for us. Again, quality really matters. The farmed salmon is, and the farmed tilapia are not the proper balance of oils we want for our brains. Particularly want the omega-3 oils EPA and DHA. And if we're concerned about our brains particularly, or if we're growing a baby, or we are a growing child, we want extra DHA. Because DHA is the omega, so EPA is kind of anti-inflammatory, it's sort of general nourishing in the brain, and DHA helps your brain make new brain cells, which we're all doing. We're doing it today. We want to do it, keep doing it for the rest of our lives. And having DHA adequate in our bloodstream um, will help us do that. Avoiding Vegetable oils, canola oil, even canola oil. Such a pretty picture. Uh, but you know, all these vegetable and seed oils and canola oil, um, if you've heard me talk, you know somebody knows what was there, why were they even invented as oils? What? They had a more intentional use than that, and I'll give you a hint. It was in World War II, and it was underwater. Submarine lubricants. Canola oil was an excellent submarine lubricant. We just didn't need any more when the war was over, and so it, we, but we had this huge canola oil production facility, so it became a popular oil. Okay, now this is getting into the sort of really specific, like I could have said that's a great diet for not getting cancer, that's a great diet for your heart, but now I want to speak really specifically about some stuff pertinent to your brain. So face it, your brains really do love sugar. It's the main fuel that fuels our brains from the time we stop nursing at our mom's breast until we intentionally try and feed them something else. It primarily lives on sugar. And you know, if I fed you, if I showed you like one piece of cake, we'd go, oh yeah, cake, I like that, I like sugar. But this picture was meant to be a little sickening. <laughs> and you know, that is kind of the state that an older brain gets to because sugars are really problematic. Much like, um, so, you know, when you're, Getting older, you tend to put on weight around the middle. And I think men go on wearing their um, adolescent waistband pants because they stop wearing them at their waist. But all of us put on a little bit of weight around the middle, and that's an indicator that our, our body's getting a little bit tired of responding to sugar. When we eat sugar, our blood sugar goes up, and our body has to make insulin in response to handle it. And it just gets a little tired of doing that. And it stops paying attention, so we start kind of, instead of using that sugar as fuel, we store it as fat. And it's particularly problematic in the brain. This is sort of a different, this is not the woman who's sweeping out the streets at night after you've got a good night of sleep. This is a little man called insulin-degrading enzyme. And in your brain, you get sugar in your brain, and you need some insulin 
just like you do in your bloodstream, to use the sugar. And if you've eaten too much sugar and you have too much insulin, insulin's hanging around like litter. And look at it, I think all this looks like sugar down here. Apple core, banana peel, candy wrappers probably. Um, so insulin's hanging around. And that little guy's job is to clean up insulin. Well, that sounds great. It's great that they have a guy to clean up the job. The only thing is this is his number one job and he only gets to his number two job when he's finished with his number one job. And his number two job is cleaning up amyloid, which is a substance that makes Alzheimer's disease. So I've, made, I've said something incorrectly at some of these um, talks, which is that as we age, we all make amyloid. And although there is some truth to that, really by the age of 50, 10%, I actually saw a statistic, 10% of people have significant amyloid in their brain by the age of 50. Um, and it goes up a little bit with every decade. But we don't all make a bunch of amyloid all the time. That was misspeaking. But to the extent that we make it, we want to clean it up. And if we're busy cleaning up insulin, we won't clean up amyloid. So much as brains love sugar, they actually prefer this guy. So this guy is a ketone. I'm sure you've heard of the ketogenic diet. And I'll, this is what I was learned, I was taught in chemistry class as a ketone. But I think of this as a ketone, you know, like kind of a little weightlifting apparatus because it really is a super fuel for your brain. Okay, so what's a ketone? So if you need to run around across the street, you can use sugar to run across the street, and you can use fat to run across the street. So if you have a hamburger, cheeseburger, you're kind of, you're really not eating any sugar. You're just eating protein, which helps build your muscles, but you're eating plenty of fat. So you can run across the street on a cheeseburger. But fat molecules are too big to get into the brain. The brain really wants to protect itself from what's floating around in the environment. So it has a blood-brain barrier. And fats cannot penetrate the blood-brain barrier. And if that was all there was to it, we wouldn't be here as a species, right? Because it's great if you have a hamburger cheeseburger. You can kind of imagine you can do something with it. But it's also true that when you're fasting and have nothing to eat for hopefully not 29 days. But, you know, because the, the food that you've gathered over the last week, has, you've eaten it all, now you need to spend three or four days finding some more food, you need to both be able to run across the street and you need to be able to think about it. So our bodies develop this great mechanism that starts with fat, and fat is a carbon chain backbone, and then stringing off of it are three chains of fats. And our body breaks it up into fatty acids. That's the chains of fats. And they can go directly to the muscle and fuel the muscle. But they can also go to the liver. And the liver takes the acetyl-CoA, -CO the fat, and turns it into a ketone, that nice little barbell thing. And that barbell goes in and makes a ketone in the brain. And the brain's very happy with it now. While it's doing that, it takes the carbon backbone and also makes glucose out of it. So out of a molecule of fat, if all you ate was fat, you get a little bit of sugar and a fair amount of ketones from the fat. So it's a pretty nutritious food for the brain. So ketones are the best brain fuel. How do we get them? And you can get them from fasting because the fuel source, so we've got fuel stored in our bodies. We all run out of the sugar stored in our bodies in less than a day. But we all, trust me, we all have enough fat to live for hopefully not 29 days, but weeks without refeeding. I mean, we've all got a lot of fat. So you can fast and know that your body will burn fat for ketones. But fasting is problematic, so there's other ways to do it. You can have certain dietary fats that help you make ketones. And the ones that are the best are... Um, they're described as, you know, as coconut oil or coming from coconut oil. How many people saw, I guess, 
who just asked me? Oh, no. Some of my longest time patients called up today and said, does Deborah think we can still eat coconut oil? Because, you know, it sort of came out again this week that coconut oil is poison. Well, coconut oil is fine. Um, there are some people who can't have too much coconut oil, but that's the, you know, that's the answer to every question. There's some people for whom that doesn't work. But coconut oil and also a little bit olive oil and avocado oil are particularly shorter chain fats, and they're very effective at getting the liver to make ketones. Very effective. And if you had this much coconut oil you'd, and didn't eat anything else, in an hour you'd have diarrhea, and in two hours you'd probably have some ketones, but it'd be hard to tell because you'd be in the bathroom the whole time. So we've, we've come up, um, the world has come up with some better formulations of ways to get the more active form of what's in the coconut oil without the urgent diarrhea. And so there's uh, this oil, which is a refined MCT oil. MCT oil is closer to coconut. This is a little farther away from coconut. And this is my current favorite in my drink here tonight, um, ketone MCT oil powder. We've gone through a couple of them at the office, and I think we've settled on this one. I'm not sure that's our container, because I think that's a, that's a, a flavored kind that has stevia in it. But it's unflavored, has no stevia in it, and mixes easily in cold water, hot drinks. Um, the wonderful thing about having ketones in your system is they uh, suppress appetite a little bit. So it's one of the things I've recommended for people who are in intractable snackers. Oh, I work all day with a little can of nuts at my computer. Oh, that's not really good for your brain. We just talked about you have to go between meals. So those are the people I really try and encourage that ketone oil on powder. And pretty soon there's going to be more products like this. They'll be available everywhere. Um, this is the company is Perfect Keto. So we've talked about all these hunks of food on your plate that you eat, but there's also some really important seasonings that go on your meals or things besides sleep that enable you to use these foods really well. And one of those things is hormones. Like you have to have your thyroid, estrogen, pregnenolone hormones working right for you to properly do the right thing with your food, and that's before we even get to the digestive hormones like insulin or glucagon. You need vitamins, and uh, I think somebody said to me recently, he eats really, really good food, and I made the joke to him that I make to other people, which is, unless you're living on the same farm your family's lived on for one or 200 years, you know it's never been contaminated, you recycle all your animal waste, and you know you grow your food from scratch, then I think you need vitamins. Uh, any survey done on commercially available food shows it's really markedly depleted, even when people are kind of intentionally using organic fertilizers. That's, a, that's better than inorganic fertilizers, but our food's depleted, so we need to add some vitamins, some minerals, some key brain nutrients, and then some therapeutic herbs. We're going to go over those. And the hormones, as I said, these are the hormones that are really important for how food affects your brain. These are the vitamins that are really important for how food affects your brain. You see the first two lines are in bold. Those are really important. And the ones down below are very important if you need them. So if you have a problem with focus, if kind of ADD is how your brain's aging, then B5 panathenic acid would be really good for you. If you have trouble getting your sleep-wake, day-night cycle uh, back in order, B3 might be really good for you. So we do try to personalize the ones that we recommend, but the ones on the top have to be adequate for everybody. And let me just say something about vitamin A. So what's your favorite food source of vitamin A? You. Carrots. Carrots. That's exactly what I wanted you to say. So I bet you can get vitamin A from carrots if you say that. But genetically, a quarter of you cannot get vitamin A from a carrot. It requires a particular enzyme 
that uh, trans transforms beta carotene into retinol. They don't even sound like they're the same thing, but they are. They're, it's, um, but the retinol palmitate is the vitamin A that's in animal food. So the liver and those egg yolks um, are also really great sources of vitamin A, but there's other sources as well, like all dairy and has vitamin A in it. And so um, if you have your 23andMe, there's three genes to look at. Um, they're BCMO1, and if they're not good to go, then you can't get your vitamin A from a carrot. Mighty minerals, really important. I think magnesium is the most, it's probably the most important because it's been the most, magnesium's been the most depleted in our soils. It's the most absent from the standard American diet, and it is also the most needed and missing if you've tended to put on too much mid-body weight as you age. So magnesium is really important, and magnesium L3 needs the particular one for the brain. Yeah? Um, chocolate. <laughs> dark, dark chocolate um, is really a good source of magnesium. Uh, dark leafy greens and nuts also have magnesium, um, but I find that most pe pe so if you know past a certain age, I think everybody needs to supplement, and so then it's a matter of picking a, a magnesium that's not doesn't give you diarrhea, magnesium oxide, magnesium citrate, one that maybe is good to relax your muscles, magnesium taurate, or one that's particularly good for your brain, this magnesium L3 and 8. Zinc and copper are really important, but it's good to have zinc higher than copper. What would you say about pumpkin seeds? Uh, I think pumpkin seeds are... The, the tricky thing about things like pumpkin seeds um, is I think they are good sources of zinc, but they have other things in them that interfere with their absorption, and they're one of those things that people most often eat as snacks. Now, if someone served me a dish that had pumpkin seeds on top of it, I'd love it. I'd eat them. That'd be great. If I was hanging out waiting for dinner and they put out a bowl of pumpkin seeds, I might not eat them. I don't know. What do you think? Do you really like them? Very yeah. yeah. So they, you know, they are a pretty good source of zinc, but I don't, I haven't seen a vegan with adequate levels of zinc. Um, but I'm sure there's some I haven't tested. But I think if you're thinking of someone who's eating no animal products, their key things to worry about are zinc and iron, um, B12, and the omega-3s. So uh, I, think, I think even most people who eat meat are deficient. Zinc is much harder to absorb uh, because of how our digestive tract ages once you're over 50. But pumpkin seeds are a great vegetable source of of zinc. Um, that isn't supposed to be hormones down there. Uh, it's supposed to be more minerals. So the mitochondria are the little powerhouses in our cells, and they particularly like these little spicy things to keep them going. Um, and anyone on a statin should be on ubiquinol. Glutathione really helps us detox. If you've got mold toxicity or heavy metal toxicity, glutathione is what your body uses to help get something out of the, the system and on its way out. And there's herbs that we use very therapeutically, like the first two that are really just part of a, the Ayurvedic medicine tradition and used for specific purposes in brain health and other things. Turmeric is like used for everything. The woman who taught with me at, spoke with me at Ashland High School, I mean, she was really um, singing the praises of all the things turmeric can do. And I tend to give people the supplement, curcumin, but if you want it in food form, the way to absorb turmeric is to mix it with a fat and to mix it with spice. So make curry out of it with coconut milk and pepper and garlic. Great way to get some extra turmeric. And even the savory herbs and other spices that you put on your meal contribute to the health of your gut and contribute to the health of your antioxidant system. And there's one more really important thing for your... Were you going to say something? Uh-huh. 
Um, I don't know that it interferes. I think it augments blood thinners, as does fish oil. But it actually does interfere with, so when people are on some detoxification programs, it's one of the things they have to stop, you know, um, but. And then, of course, you know, like coffee is good for you. We still, we can't find anything that's wrong with coffee, except one thing. What's the one thing that can be wrong with coffee? Sugar, but you're right, and especially in this. And I would actually add to this the dairy for some of us. But the caffeine is so personal. Like, I cannot have caffeine after noon. Um, anybody, is anybody here one of those people that can have caffeine and then go to bed? There are, I know there are people like that. See, there's three of you here. So the three basic steps I want you to, to keep with you to the after this is that it's really great for you to fast overnight and sleep well. And that's one of the best food gifts you can give your brain, particularly if the next day you eat real food and you just eat meals. And then finally, I think everyone for, with interest in their brain, and I said fish or fish oil, but since it's a vegetarian kind of question came from there, there is algae oil too. So it's the ingredients in fish oil that you need. It doesn't need to come from fish. It can come from algae, but that's it. I mean, the other oils like flax oil are not the same. Um, but those three things will take you a long way if you're at normal risk and normal health um, to have a healthy brain. Um, I want everybody to remember, if you haven't read Dale Bredesen's book, it's really enjoyable to read. It's got great anecdotes in it. His website is MPI Cognition, and he talks about the progress of his work. On my website, and actually on Northwest Memory Center's website as well, I have a do-it-yourself brain health series. So say you've decided not to, you know, you don't need a doctor about this. You're pretty confident in your brain. But you know I've talked about a whole bunch of lab tests, or you just want to know if the diet that you're eating is good for your brain. You can look through these, this three-part series on do-it-yourself brain health and go a long ways to seeing if you're on completely the right track or if there's anything important you're missing. And I do encourage people to get their genetics. And we're back here the last Tuesday of every month. And in September, we're going to talk about dementia subtypes. That's of less general interest, but it's pretty interesting to people who have one of the subtypes. So what are the subtypes? So the, the main three types of Alzheimer's disease that affect people with the APOE4 gene are either inflammation, toxic from sugar, or you're not feeding me. And that you're not feeding me is everything we talked about tonight. You're not feeding me with hormones. You're not feeding me with vitamins. And then separate from that, there's a toxic brain situation, and that's way more common. What were we saying, Rachel? We think how many people have some issue of toxicity? I don't know. It's shocking. I would say almost half our people. <laughs> have some degree of toxicity from mold toxins or heavy metals. And um, as Rachel said, oh, we're all told this is a toxic world, but this is the first time I've actually tested for it, <laughs> um, and it seems to be true. And then traumatic, so people who, you know, the, the football players, chronic traumatic encephalopathy confers with it a kind of dementia. So that, those are the five subtypes. Um, and in, we're in Ashland at noon on the last Thursday of every other month. So that'll be September and November. <clears throat> and you can find us at northwestmemorycenter.com or at that phone number. And our team is ready to be helpful if we can. Any other questions? Can you speak more about why you don't like canola oil? Why I don't like canola oil? Uh, yes, so um, most canola, canola oil is processed pretty terribly. Um, you, it, and it's subjected the oil, so it's a very fragile oil, and it's subjected the oil to heats and pressures to which you would never subject it in the kitchen. Okay, so you could buy cold pressed expeller canola oil that's in a dark bottle, and that would be less bad for you. But it's, so what, um, besides looking for these 
So you're always thinking about your ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s as you get older. And I have not seen anybody that had a low level of omega-6s. Even people who are eating, you know, kind of like, I don't think I'm eating any omega-6s, but I have omega-6s. And I, I, I tell people if, you know, I have a, okay, if you're high 20 to 24, that's okay. If you're high above 25, we have to find what you're eating too much of and probably reduce it some in your diet. So canola oil is kind of like walnuts that relative to no omega-3, they have some omega-3 in them, but they, it really doesn't have a good ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s. And it continues to be fragile, so you shouldn't, it should definitely not cook with it. But if you wanted, if you, someone served you a salad dressing and you knew it was made with expeller, cold pressed canola oil, I'd eat it. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that he said fructose is bad for the brain. So there's a, a professor of pediatrics at um, San Francisco, um, Lustig, David Lustig, not David Ludwig, but I think it's David Lustig. And um, he is all, like, fructose is the downfall of modern human civilization. But my understanding about fructose is that it goes when you eat fructose, it goes directly actually to your liver and it gums things up in your liver and it's our tendency to get gout and fatty liver come from fructose rather than from anything else. And, um, and I'm not specifically sure about the brain, so I'm gonna look into that. Dehydrates the brain. Well, I, the only thing I can think of is that, you know, you're when you eat fructose, it does not raise your blood sugar. So, uh, uh, but on the other hand, it probably impairs your liver from, this is, I bet this is what it is. So it doesn't raise your blood sugar. It doesn't give your brain sugar as a fuel, but it, it distracts your liver. So it's not, it's like alcohol in that sense. It makes it hard for the liver to do what it wants to do when you don't have any food, it wants to make you ketones, but if it's busy processing alcohol or storing fructose as fat, I bet that's what it does that kind of starves the brain that way. It's a thought, I'll look into it, yeah. Hi. Hi, um, uh, glutathione, um, dosages? Glutathione, there's a whole... Yeah. yeah. Um, I think during the smoke, we should have all been taking it every day. And uh, so there are a, a bunch of different ways to take it, and the most readily available is probably Jaro's reduced glutathione, 500 milligrams that all the stores have around here. There's a liquid form I have at my office that is better absorbed, so it's a lower dose. It's called liposomal glutathione, but it's more expensive. But if someone were really toxic, that would be a step up. For somebody who's really toxic and suffering, say, you know, you just, you go in to clean out your nephew's house and it's all moldy and there's rat poop and you are like, oh, ugh. you can get um, in a nebulized glutathione from the compounding pharmacy and you can actually get intravenous glutathione. So those are the two, that's really ratcheting up your game but either the reduced glutathione at 500 milligrams or liposomal, and that'll be anywhere from 100 to 250, depending whose brand you have, are the more routine ways to take it. And are there other supplements that you would recommend? Um, I mean, I'm sure antioxidants. Right. An antioxidant, right, mostly the antioxidants, and then it would kind of, so um, depend on the people and how they react to it. So. Uh, if somebody had a tremendous allergic response, I'd say it would be really important for them to avoid foods that can also trigger allergic responses. So you're not usually sensitive to gluten and dairy, but go off it during hay fever season or go off it after you've cleaned that house because it's going to make your gut more leaky and then you're going to be more vulnerable to all those things. So 
you know, it kind of depends, you know, in general, zinc is good for your immune system and vitamin A, C, and E, yeah. Michael? Eating avocados, is that your first one? No, olives. Olives. I think olives are great for people. So they, they also really protect you from type 2 diabetes or fatty liver. I think um, olives are a great food. And having six, you know, like instead of an apple a day, have an avocado a day and six olives. That, that'd be great. Eating coconut meat, great. You know, I mean, it, it, so it's an amazing food in that it, tastes so sweet, but it is not as sweet as it tastes. I mean, in terms of what it does to most people's blood sugar, if you're just eating the plain coconut meat itself. But people with the ApoE4 gene, some of them need to avoid coconut because it's inflammatory for them. And I think that whole pH thing is bullshit. <laughs> I think it's bullshit. I mean, I think it's so, like, I, you should eat a well-balanced diet, but it's not because it's going to change the pH in your bloodstream. Your kidneys and your lungs are taking care of that. And so um, I'm of the skeptical school about thinking that your choices at lunch versus dinner are changing the pH of your bloodstream. Unless you're sick. Like, really sick. Priscilla? You know, that's a, that, uh, what kind of you can you eat in terms of potatoes. And, um, you know, if you have a bit of a blood sugar problem, you should probably just eat sweet potatoes. If you don't have a blood sugar problem, you could eat sweet potatoes, yams, and white potatoes. But if you have an anti-inflammatory problem like arthritis, you probably shouldn't eat white potatoes. You may not be able to. You know, it's kind of a trial and error thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I get to skate quinoa because I don't think it's a grain. I think it's a seed or something like that. You know, it, it depends how you react to it. So, um, you know, I don't eat ice cream anymore, but I eat rice. And I know it raises my blood sugar. And I have to actually test it sometime. But instead, I just try to not eat very much very often. But if I was following my blood sugar, I would test it with quinoa. It sh so if somebody's really sensitive to gluten... <laughs> It's common that their body eats something else that they ate in the same role that they ate gluten, and they, your body reacts to it, at least temporarily, as if it's gluten. So the most common thing that your body confuses with gluten is dairy. They're not at all alike, I know, but a lot of people seem allergic to dairy, and then they take out gluten for a couple months, and then they can eat dairy again. But on testing the foods that are most cross or that, are, that your body confuses with gluten, are quinoa, I think chocolate, um, but that's an individual kind of test. I think on its own, if it doesn't raise your blood sugar, quinoa is a, a good food if you like it. And rice really raises our blood sugar, I hate to say, but it's true. Even brown rice. Even brown rice. So pumpkin seed oil, you talk a lot about oil. So all the seed oils, they just have to do too much nasty stuff to them to turn them into oils. So with any of these seed oils or so-called vegetable oils, if it's expeller, cold, press, it's a little bit better for you, but most of them they've done too much. Uh, high heat, high pressure to these delicate oils. So um, trans fats are now, everybody knows trans fats are bad, and they're really bad because they did too many things to oils and they became foreign to our bodies. Um, and now, though, you're not allowed to put trans fats in food unless it's less than one gram per serving. So you just make your serving small. And so trans fats in these vegetable and seed oils, are, I don't think, are safe bets. If you know it's been expeller, cold, pressed, and you love it, great. I mean, everybody eats some stuff that they love that's not perfect for their brain unless they're really on a brain rehab program. Then they have to be very careful. And you're skinny, but you, even you have body fat to burn. I do. <laughs> but I, but it's, more, it's really like a mental thing. 
Sure. Yeah. So I think I would have to, it would have to be longer than a day or two, maybe months. Oh, yes. No, I think it takes a long time to change yeah. habitual patterns. And if you look, so the, the person I first suggested powdered ketones to because he was an inveterate snacker had a real blood sugar problem. And we've watched as his blood sugar problem has gotten better, he's less of a snacker. So... If you don't have much of a blood sugar problem, it's just habitual, it'll probably be a couple of weeks. If you actually have a blood sugar problem, it might be months. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Yeah. And you have to look harder for blood sugar problems than typical testing, I think. What is considered a high blood sugar if I were to test after eating all or a sugar? Uh-huh. Going up over 120 two hours after a meal is worrisome. Really good question. Really good question. Thank you. So I really only like to recommend fish oil from stores that I know won't leave their fish oil out on the loading dock in the summertime. So I love Costco. They carry Barleen's, which is a really great fish oil. I don't believe they don't leave it out on the dock. So I would only buy it from the co-op or myself. So the only commercially available fish oils that I would recommend would be Nordic Naturals, and barleans and getting them from kind of a health food store where you at least can hope that they've refrigerated them because a not good fish oil is worse than no fish oil at all. So they say, anyway. What's your favorite book to teach potatoes? Is it, of course, fiber and the sweet potato is a really good book, or is it just the white potato is a nice shade, and then what about the other fiber? Mm -hmm. Right, so the white, there's the both problems. So the color, so white, so comparing sweet potatoes and, and white potatoes, what makes sweet potatoes more acceptable? And somewhat of it, it's the fiber and the color, and they just really are less sweet. Like a, um, a potato raises your blood sugar quite a bit, but there's a trick for people who really, who really likes white potatoes. I really like white potatoes, and I really do like them hot with butter. But... If I cook them, keep them overnight, and eat them as potato salad, they do not raise your blood sugar. They turn into a starch, a resistant starch, by their cooling overnight, and they're much better for most people. They will not raise their blood sugar. But for most people, white potatoes have the double whammy of raising their blood sugar more than sweet potatoes and being nightshades, which somebody with autoimmune could be vulnerable to. Perfect. It's great. Yeah, can you absorb um, some uh, magnesium or coconut through your skin? And so I think coconut oil on your skin, I don't think you're going to absorb any of the benefits from it, like the ketones or the medium chain fatty acids, but it is a great non-toxic skin moisturizer. And magnesium oil, absolutely, it's quantified how much you can absorb through your skin. And I highly recommend it. So for people who get cramps in the night. If you've got cramps in a big muscle, you're probably either, but if it's a magnesium problem, if you've got cramps in a big muscle, you're probably magnesium deficient and you should take some because the blood vessels should be getting to those big muscles. If you have cramps in your little muscles, like the base of your calf or your feet, you probably just are shutting down that circulation a little bit at night and magnesium oil topically is much better or Epsom salts baths, I heard somebody say. Yeah. Um, there is a company for people who really hate taking supplements that makes really good forms of the B vitamins that are topical. It's called Neuroscience, I think. It's expensive. It's a more expensive way to take a supplement that even isn't very expensive. Um, I definitely, so what about the smart drugs, the, like the aracetams and then the choline, GDP choline, and 
definitely have um, anecdotal evidence of people that have really been helped by those. So I think they're always, so when somebody, I think it's always worth a try after the basics are covered. And Dale Bredesen would say the same thing. Well, you're, you don't have any brain problem. You just have a big test to study for. You want to try one of those, great, try it. They're not going to do any harm. And for some people, they really enhance the brain. So do really simple things like theanine, you know, which is a GABA precursor and just kind of helps focus the brain. So any of those things can help the brain work. Um, and the choline ones particularly can help some of the um, systems going wrong when somebody's actually getting dementia. But that would never be as good as really fixing your diet, fixing your sleep, fixing your hormone, you know, doing all that, and then adding those to it. That'd be great. I once listened to a talk on this awakening and Alzheimer's or something like that. And I think they said it was the same with the masking. It's really good for issues like that. Huh. I have that podcast. I haven't heard that episode. Awakening from Alzheimer's. There's a couple Alzheimer's podcasts now. I think you should. I think you should take supplements when you eat, pretty much. So when you say fast, you mean fasting. I really mean fasting. But if you're having trouble snacking, using these ketone powders with water is great. But yeah, well, it's better to not eat anything. But it's better to eat that than to eat ice cream or nuts or something like that. Take your ketones. Yeah, at the end of dinner. So I usually recommend having your dinner, having your ketone drink after dinner, and expect that you're going to go four or five hours easily without eating again. Uh, other question is sleep. Uh, you, know, you say eight hours is best. I tend to do like four or five hours and then three more something. And I know... We need to talk. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I think that's a really tricky problem, and it happens more to women than men. Um, you men get your hormones for your whole life. We don't keep ours our whole life, and even when we replace them, they often don't work as well as if we kept them all along, but then we'd have all these babies, so that's a good, I'm glad I don't have that, but um, waking up in the middle of the night is problematic, and if you wake up, turn over, and go back to sleep, that's probably fine. If you wake up and you're up for half an hour or an hour, you're probably losing some of the benefit of that nice lady hosing out the restaurant. What do you think about xylitol as a sweetener for coffee? Uh-huh. What do I think about xylitol as a sweetener for coffee? It's actually in my fish oil at my office, too. Or is that sorbitol? No, I think it's xylitol. Is it xylitol or sorbitol? It's one of those. So all the, t all the sugar alcohols are much less um, toxic in the body. And so they're, I, I, like, I think that would be a better sweetener than sugar. And people who have real blood sugar problems, anything that tastes sweet, their body's going to think it's sugar and make insulin even though you don't. So when you eat if you put two teaspoons of sugar in your coffee, your blood sugar goes up, and your body has to make insulin to bring it back down. It, and the sugar's problematic, and the insulin gets problematic because it hangs around. But if you eat a really sweet coffee drink that's made with xylitol or stevia, your body thinks you just ate sugar, and it's going to make the insulin whether you ate the sugar or not. It does it from the taste, not from the blood sugar going up. So the longer, the more of a sugar problem you have, the more true that is. But um, I've had several people test it where they only have stevia and their blood sugar goes down, and that means they made insulin to lower their blood sugar. So does that okay? No, because you've got insulin. If they could measure their insulin, you'd see that your insulin went up, and insulin's pretty inflammatory. But... If you don't have much of a blood sugar problem, if you don't gain weight around your middle, if all your blood sugar tests are normal and you love a little bit of xylitol in your coffee, it's fine. If you really have a blood sugar problem or a cognition problem, it's probably not. Learn to love whole cream. Thank you all for coming. We're going to sort of wrap things up and then hang around a little bit. Thank you all.